This week in the house with me, Harriet Walker, our ever-lifting dietitian. How are you? Very well, thanks, Greg. How are you doing? Good. You've been uh, training a fair bit, I hear? I have been training. I'm in good form. Nice. Hey, Harriet, what have we got you this week? I ran across a post this week that was fitness influencer versus science, and it went along the lines of weight loss, all foods under the same category of calories, just ma- map out your calories. The, calorie. the other side was titled science. No, some foods are more satiating, some foods increase your metabolism, some help maintain your muscle while dieting. Each of these factors, among others, affect weight loss. I actually want to go, let's talk about that. Yeah, look, that sounds really confusing. So how about we have a go at making it more simple for everybody? Perfect. Let's go. Welcome to the Body Science Podcast, bringing you everything you need, want, and should know about health, fitness, nutrition, and training. As always, the information contained in this podcast is for the information purposes only and is not designed to diagnose or be prescriptive to treat, prevent, or manage any injury, disease, or other health-related condition. <laughs> Today's podcast is brought to you by PreUltra, an extreme, high-stim, pre-workout, scientifically formulated for anyone wanting to push it further than they ever have before. A powerful combination of performance enhancing and nootropic ingredients delivered at industry leading dosages. Pre-Ultra gives you explosive power, strength and intense pump alongside the laser-like focus, mental clarity, energy and drive to annihilate your next workout. Welcome to Body Science HQ, the house of fit, happy, healthy. Today, we're going to throw in their calories as well. And um, the big question out here, Harriet, is are calories calories? That is a really good question and one I am looking forward to digging deep into. Before we rip into are they equal, let's talk about what is a calorie. So calorie is just a unit of energy we use to describe like the energy content of food. Why do we use calorie? Calorie is just a way of gauging how much energy we're consuming per day. So yeah. it's a useful mechanism to sort of quantify the value of a diet. So different macronutrients have different calorie contents and they figured this out by burning the food. It Basically, when you burn food, it emits heat and the amount of heat that was produced gave an indication of how much energy was being used in the burning of it. So called the at water experiment. They use a bomb calorimeter to burn the food, increases the temperature of the water surrounding the food, and that gave a calorie figure. And when you said you, they did that with all the macros like protein, fats and carbs, that's yep. what you're talking about? Yep. So they've basically there's a sort of a set of numbers that we have now is fairly standard and from there we can figure out recipes and you know combinations of foods and And all that kind of thing yeah absolutely so the big question the million dollar question are they all created equally well yeah, like that's a really good question. There's a f- there's a few different parts to it. So, I mean, first you've got to start off with, you know, why are we looking at this? We're probably looking at it, you know, from somebody's asked about weight loss and what's the best way to lose weight. you got your if it fits your macros bros who are like, well, you know, if you eat within your calorie deficit, that's going to be yep. same, you know, in, out, calories mm-hmm. in versus calorie out, which is 100% correct. So the Kiko calories in, calories out crew, uh, they're on the right track. You yep. know, when we consume more food than we we burn, we put on weight. When we consume less food, then we burn, we lose weight. Yep. And if we get it right, we stay weight neutral. So that's kind of cool. But the thing we kind of need to look at, either side of that Kiko calories in, calories out equation, there's a few different things that can impact it. So when people start saying calories aren't equal, you know, it's not calories in, calories out, or oh, there's some nuance to that message. Okay. And it really comes down to the things that can affect the energy coming in and things that can affect the calories coming out. That still remains the same, but there are things either side of that equation that can increase or decrease calories in, calories out. Okay, well, let's hit it. So the things that affect how much calories you consume are, you know, your appetite. You might eat more food. Therefore, you're taking on more energy. The palatability of the food. So if something is really hyper palatable, i.e. can't put it down, it's delicious. Generally, that's your sugary, fatty foods, donuts, croissants. Chocolate. Chocolate. Ice cream. That kind of stuff. High palatability factor, which means that my ability to say, stop, I had enough, is reduced. Energy density of foods. So I might have a, you know, a date almond bliss ball and it's only a small amount of food, but it's quite energy dense. There might be three. 300 calories in that thing and I haven't really wow, factored in for that. it looks so healthy too. It looks so small and healthy, whereas I could have a plate of food, which is 300 calories, that looks like 
you know, an entire meal. So things like stress, your psychology, your state, your mental state can impact how much food you take in because when you're being driven to despair by something, sometimes people turn to food and that's actually going to impact how much you food, food you eat in the day. So that's energy in. Other side of that is the energy out. This is basically like what's your ba- uh, basal metabolic rate? So how big is your body and how much energy does it require just to stay alive? Mm-hmm. That's the thing. Then we have things like muscle mass will yep. impact how much energy you burn each day. So yep. because muscle is a metabolically active tissue, it requires more energy in order to be maintained and to be built. Things like um, exercise, so how much ex exercise you do will increase or decrease the amount of energy you put out each day. Then we have incidental exercise and movement. So this is non-planned Stand exercise. Stand up, go for Stand a walk. Stand up, sit down, you know, fidget. If you're a fidgeter, you're going to actually be burning more calories than somebody who's quite restful. Just might get my leg going now, is that right? Yep. Hey, easy. It's quick. It's cheap calories. <laughs> then we've got this concept called your thermic effect of food. It costs energy to Yeah, that's a big one. Can you food. dig deep on that? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Well, what I was going to do, we'll go through these ones and then we'll go through those in, in, in more detail. Okay, cool. But yeah, so and how much we move, composition of your meal. They'll all impact What do you how mean by the composition of my meal? So I'll talk about this in more detail, mm. but basically like protein, carbs, fats, the macronutrient composition will actually it costs more energy to burn certain macronutrients. So mm-hmm. just for the fact that you might change one of those might increase or decrease the amount of energy required in order to digest that meal, which is increasing your energy out. Okay, beautiful. Um, but you'll notice that energy in is a little bit more like up to the person. You know, it's it's more emotionally driven. It's choice. more psych- psychological choice. Like we have the choice about what goes in, whereas what gets burnt, exercise, you know, you can do more exercise and you burn more energy. But in terms of BMR, basal metabolic rate, muscle mass, you know, the composition of food, we don't have a whole bunch of control over that. So it's quite interesting to see like energy coming in versus energy coming out. One's sort of driven by, you know, human factors. No one forces us to eat. And the other is caused by just physiological requirements and, you know, getting the job done essentially. So, yeah, interesting. But what we want to talk about here <coughs> is the fact that there are a number of factors beyond calories in, calories out that actually impact someone's perception of how much they're eating. And I think this is like where fullness. it kind of goes in. Yeah, yep, yeah. Okay. So satiety is probably the word that we use to describe the feeling of fullness and like a decreased drive to eat. So yep. if a meal is highly satiating, somebody, you know, there's no desire to eat further. Like you're full, you're satisfied, there's no niggle to go eat anything more. So that's really what we're going for when it comes to eating. We want to feel full, we want to feel satisfied, and we want to feel like, you know, we, we don't actually need to go for anything more. But we can actually manipulate the food that we consume in order to increase the satiety factor of a meal or when we consume foods that are small, energy dense. Uh, I'm a visual person. Like a Mars bar. Yeah, I like to like see a, the volume. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You mm. know, we want to see a lot of food on our plate. Yeah. We can still see a lot of food, but by manipulating the composition of that meal, we can actually decrease the calorie content. So we're kind of, you know, rejigging not necessarily the calories in, calories out in terms of, you know, the calories are still what they are, but we can actually play with either side of that equation in order to get the desired effect, whatever that may be, weight gain, weight loss. Okay. So... Things that are low in energy density. So when I say energy density, I mean low in calories. These are the good guys. These are the good guys. The high volume. Load that plate up. High fiber <clears throat> and usually have a high water factor. So we're looking at whole foods here, foods that haven't been processed, that haven't had any of their compartments move, removed. And I mean, the biggest ones here are going to be fruits and vegetables. So they're high in nutrients, lots of vitamins and minerals, high fiber, high water content. So how you've talked about low energy density, high volume foods, fiber, high Whole foods, fruit and veggies, yeah, blah, blah, blah. We all love that stuff. Our eyes are bigger. We like to see stuff. So that does work for us. Lots of colors, building out larger meals, using those low calorie foods is good for managing intake without feeling deprived. But let's be honest, we're talking about calories here. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Give me some. Give me some deep. All right. So I think you know using so increasing satiety using volume 
to do so is important. So like you said, yeah, good story, high energy, okay? <laughs> yeah, good chat. Yeah. Uh, right, moving right along. Give me some reasons. Like, let me give me some numbers. We're going to look at the concept of the thermic effect of food. Now that's getting way sexier. Yeah, Let's so that's like um, that's chocolate. A big, that's a big word. I've said that twice There's today. I don't to do even. With chocolate. I'm not even a chocolate fan. Where did chocolate come from? I don't know. It's not chocolate that we're talking about. We are talking <laughs> about the thermic effect of food. So basically, this is your metabolic response to food. So when we can talk- you explain what that means? My metabolic response to food is what? When we break down food, stuff happens. We have to spend money to make money, Greg. So in order to access the energy within our food, we have to actually spend a bit of energy to digest it, to absorb it, to smush it down and to crack it open so that we can get, it can go through all the metabolic processes that allow us to use that food as energy. Yeah. So some food is more expensive to break down than others. So some food has a higher metabolic response, metabolic requirement in order to be accessed as food. So when we look at the short-term increase in energy expenditure that occurs when we digest food, between the three macronutrients, we see somewhere in the vicinity of 15 to 30% increase in metabolic rate when we consume protein. Ah, we see hence the popularity of the high protein diet. Absolutely. We see a 5 to 10% increase in metabolic rate when we consume carbohydrates and we see somewhere from 0 to 3% increase in metabolic rate when we consume fat. Oh, so fat's easy to eat and it's easy to store. Yeah. So when we look at the caloric value of each of those macronutrients, protein, 4 calories per gram, carbs, 4 calories per gram, fat, 9, nine. calories per gram. And then we see that protein increases our metabolic rate by up to 30% above normal levels. It's actually looking pretty good. Now, this is not to say that we need to eat only protein. So you're saying the carnivore diet's the way to go? Uh, that's zero to do Kev, with what I'm I said saying. It. I got it in there, Kev. Ah, oh, this is killing me, guys. But basically- hey, if Kev from 98 Gym can do it, I can do it too. I know. I, well, I haven't given permission for you either, <laughs> either of you to do it. And normally you should come to me first. Yep. So big boy decisions. All I heard was protein. All I heard was protein. 15 to 30%. That's a fair chunk. Yeah, it is. It's quite compelling. So mm. basically protein is the most satiating and then carbs and then fat. And then backwards from that, fat provides us the most energy. So it's l- as less satiating, higher energy density. Uh, I'll go into fats in a little bit more detail. And the body obviously likes dealing with fat at 3%. It's not working real hard. No, it's pretty easy to use as energy. Carbs is pretty easy to use it as energy. The reason, I mean, protein is not necessarily a major energy source for our body. It's there in case we need to make more energy. We can use <clears throat> protein as energy, but it's the least efficient way, as you can see, from the how hard our body has to actually work in order to access that energy. We need to make sure we're having a balanced diet so that we're not sort of ripping into our protein stores in, in order to meet our energy requirements. And, you know, that's what happens when we under eat too much. We start chipping away at our lean body mass, which is stored protein, muscle fibers, which can, you know, increase or decrease our muscle mass. So we yep. just need to be a little bit careful not to take that recommendation so, you know, only have protein. Yeah. So mm, why okay. is protein so satiating? That's um, a good question. Why is it? Hmm. So... What we know is that it's likely to do with some of the hormones associated with satiation, so um, with hunger appetite. So when we consume protein, we get an increase in the secretion of certain satiety hormones. So we've got our glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide or GIP, uh, long word. It's a hormone. It gets released when we consume protein and it can help with satiety. And we've also got another hormone called glucagon-like peptide 1, GLP-1, also has a satiating effect when it's in it, when it protein is consumed, those two hormones get released. And it's believed that that is something to do with the mechanism of increasing satiety. And there's been a lot of research done on various ways to manipulate energy intake using protein. So one study uh, by Hall looked at having a protein shake around 90 minutes prior to a meal. Being a protein shake maker, what did they have? A whey protein. Any casein in that? Casein was also looked at, but they found that casein, because it's digested slightly slower, didn't have a, as big an impact. Okay. So whey protein showed to decrease energy intake at subsequent meals after having that protein shake 90 minutes earlier. So take away from that. Take it, make of it what you will. You know, having what about a protein, our plant mates? Pea protein has also been studied. They have actually pitted pea protein and whey protein against each other. I think pea protein actually came up pretty well as well. I think it actually might have on one study 
pipped whey protein in terms of satiety factor, you, you know, similar model. I can't actually remember the study I was looking at for that one, but there was a pea protein study in there. But yeah, so basically uh, this is, I mean, the takeaway is obviously we're not going to have protein shakes at every meal. Oh, no, you're not. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, but we can take away that having a good chunk of protein at each meal is a nice way of increasing our feelings of fullness, which should decrease the drive to eat at subsequent meals and probably reducing our overall energy intake. So it's just one of the tools that we can use to curb appetite and keep our energy in balance. And also we have that increased in increase in metabolic rate associated with increased protein intake. We actually see more calories burnt. I think there was some research looking at this and we saw that, you know, it could be somewhere in the vicinity of 100, 150 so cows extra burnt each day, which across the course of a year is actually quite significant. So, you know, every little bit counts. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's another study I wanted to have a look at when we're looking specifically at satiety. So there was, it's a bit of a, an old school classic study. It was from about- Nothing wrong with a bit of old school. Nothing wrong with a bit of old school. Mm. So it was 1995. It was actually done out of the University of Sydney, I believe, by Holt. And they took 38 different types of foods. They classified them into fruits. Can I ask you something? Who comes up with 38? I don't know. Not 35, not 40, 38. I don't know. You can don't ask you? old mate Holt. And have a have a check and see. Maybe that was his favourite number. Okay. Or maybe enough. it divided nicely into six groups. Ah. Okay. I can't count yeah. right now, but I don't know if that. I can't check out that theory because I don't have a calculator in front of me, and I only do maths on Mondays. So six six to thirty six. Yeah, I'm just throwing it out there. So, so what did they look at? They looked at whether the satiety factor of each of those foods. So basically, come they, on, we want to look at what they ate. What what did they do? They. Uh, I'm getting to it. Okay. So 11 people were given these foods in isolation. There's, there were six categories of food. There was uh, fruits, bakery, goods, snacks, carb-rich foods, protein-rich foods, and cereals. So they okay. consumed the food and they were uh, they ranked the food in terms of satiety, so how feeling the feeling of fullness they were experiencing, every 15 minutes for two hours. And that gave them a curve. They had to eat every 15 minutes for two hours? I think they ate the food. Yep. And then... They, oh, they looked at what happened. They looked at yeah, what happened. Gotcha. So they said, how do you feel now? Okay. How do you feel now? How about now? So basically what they were getting was some sort of curve or some sort of shape yep. from each of those time points. And from that data, they actually con- uh, compared it to against a piece of white bread and they were able to give it a satiety index from okay. that. And that was expressed as a percentage of white bread. So when we looked at the foods that came out as being the most satiating, we had... Do you want to guess what it was? You're going to say something like fish. No. No. Well, the number one Mm. was a white potato. Really? So let's look at the properties of a white potato. Got carbs, uh, fiber, um, starchy, high water content, vegetable, and potato by itself is filling. That was the most satisfying food out of all of them. It's filling, but it's you can't overeat plain potato. Baked, salted, buttered potato I could have all day long. Oh, this is like straight plain up. This was just a straight plain potato. Were they biting through the skin or were they eating the inside, you know? I think they were probably eating the whole whole potato. So, you know, when we look at the properties of that potato, it makes sense. Number two, you had it. Fish. Fish. Fish was number two. Well, I just figured protein and fat. Yeah. Stabbed. And then things like porridge, apples, oranges, grapes, brown pasta were the other top performers. I get porridge, apples and oranges. Fruit. High water content, so they make you feel full for less calories. <laughs> high fiber. You know, so fruit's quite a feeling thing. Have you ever tried to overeat apples, like, an, you know, or a piece of fruit? I could eat a whole bag of dried apples, but when I consume oh, one apple- Oh, you wouldn't be good to be around after that. L- we won't talk about the after <laughs> effect, but, but if I tried to eat like five apples, which is probably the equivalent of a packet of dried apples, I, I get bored after one. I'd have one apple and be like, yeah, cool. I'd struggle to get through two. My my will to live after having three is just not Yeah, there. fair, cool. So that's- the so water you, content of that is really. So when's the potato apple diet coming out? Potato apple. I'm actually writing rapid weight loss right diet right now. Yeah. Um. Just eat two apples and potatoes. Actually, I think there is a potato diet. I think no, that someone already okay. beat me to that one. But potato apple potentially. Let me look into it. The and one pasta that, was a top performer too. Yeah. Whole grain pasta. Okay. Brown. Yep. Whole wheat, high fiber content, carbohydrates. Highly satiating. But what didn't increase feelings of satiety or satisfaction, which were the worst performers, were the baked goods. 
and the snack foods. So croissants were the least satiating. <gasps> I'm a bit devastated. Uh, I quite like a croissant. Bring on the haters, I say. What's your Instagram account? Athletic eating. <laughs> at athletic eating. If you don't like croissants, tell wow. me about it. What That's else was not satisfying? Cake, Mars bars, energy dense, and they, nutrient poor. They truly performed at the worst. Bah, 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 bah. Yeah, they did. They were not satisfying. They might have been mentally satisfying. They might have been fun to yeah, eat. Yeah, let's get that shit in, but not. But after two hours. Hours, somebody was hungry again. So you'll so notice this in people. Brown pasta was good for me feeling full, and you use words like fibre. Mm-hmm. We're talking a cake. Like, what's in a cake? Sugar, yeah. flour, white flour, butter, okay. eggs. Have you not cooked a cake recently, Greg? No, not recently. <laughs> not recently. Or ever? All the cakes we do at home are very different to normal cakes. So basically what they said, the outcomes were that protein, fibre, and water were positively correlated with satiety, and fat was inversely correlated with satiety. Wow. So less associated. But we do have to take this with a grain of salt because it doesn't say salt here anyway. There was no there was no salt and that <laughs> was a pun. Joke. Sorry, dad joke. <laughs> <laughs> if oh. I had that potato with a grain of salt, yes. might not have Game been as satiating, which is my next point, that we don't eat foods in isolation. Yep. We eat foods as a meal. I don't just eat fish alone. I don't just eat, well, I might just eat apple alone, but, you know, we generally eat mixed meals, and I think that plays into this quite a lot. And what they don't take into account is when I process that food, like a potato goes from being the most satiating to being one of probably the least satiating once I've chopped it thin fried it in oil and covered it in salt you know so the the cooking method and the flavoring methods play into this and would probably skew that outcome a little bit i dare say if we um went on to study that one fat is a funny one in here so it, it's kind of looking well, like a bit of a bad guy so far, yeah, yeah no. I, I thought i would i would come back and you know have a little bit of a look into fat and maybe try and pull up some of its finer points there's a little bit more detail that we need to go into with with fat. So fat actually does have a satiety factor. It does actually increase feelings of satisfaction. So when we get fat into the digestive tract, it reduces hunger and it does actually see a release in some of those satiety hormones like cholecystokinin, which is a CC, CCK for short. It's another hormone associated with satiety that gets released. So that actually does happen. But what is interesting with this is the type of fat has you know, they're looking at the type of fat as being the difference. So generally speaking, they've found that the chain length of the fat actually plays into how satisfying it is. Um, so what do you mean by that? Because I can't pick a label up and go chain length chain of that length. fat. Well, long I'm getting a total fat and a saturated and short, fat. Excuse the pun. Yep. Um, yeah, they're looking at saturated fat versus unsaturated fat. And one study by Jerome in 2009 looked at the effects of fat saturation on satiety and hormone relief and found that when they infused the fats into the ileum, which is a part of the digestive tract, and found that unsaturated fats, so things like our mono, uh, so olive oil, avocado, nuts, seeds are higher in the unsaturated fats, they increase satiety, whereas the saturated fats do not increase satiety. So okay. I thought that was kind of interesting. So it's not it all fats are unsatiating. We do have a higher satisfaction satiation factor with our, our unsa- uh, unsaturated fats, which mm, is same yeah. calorie value too. Interesting. Yeah. Yep. 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 So this is why this topic can be quite confusing for people. When we say a calorie is a calorie is a calorie, kind of. Yeah. I don't want to confuse it for people because it is a matter of calories in, calories out. You yeah, can keep consume more calories yep. than you. Bom, bom. Do you, then you burn, you're going to put on weight and vice versa. However, there are, like I said, factors that impact either side of that equation. So whether it be things that drive you to eat more or things that stop you from moving more, you know, there's things that either side of that equation that can be changed. It doesn't change the fact that calories in, calories out. It just changes the amount of calories going in or the amount of calories being burnt. So that's probably the, the critical factor here is that all things being equal – Calories in, calories out is the most important thing. But we do need to be aware that there are ways in which how we eat, what we eat will actually impact the satiety factor. So when we're looking at improving the quality of our diet and potentially looking at, you know, making some changes, we want to make sure that we're choosing some of those more of those nutrient dense 
energy, not poor, but lower energy density foods. So using those foods to our advantage to increase the volume, which increases the satisfaction factor, including a source of protein at that meal, looking at whole grain carbohydrates or the high fiber content of foods, and then looking at those unsaturated fats as being the ones, you know, according to some of these studies here, um, more satisfying. So yeah, it is, it's a funny one. And I, I wouldn't normally, you have to have a bit of context around those sorts of recommendations. Mm. We don't want to confuse people by saying it's not one thing. It's never is one thing, unfortunately, when it comes to nutrition. It's, it's a lot of it is about context. But yeah, so I think that's, does that kind of answer your question, Greg? Yeah, it's pretty good. So it's, you know, it's 2020. It's the new year. We've probably all done our New Year's resolutions. Got three tips for me on a calorie is not a calorie. Well, I would say if your New Year's resolution is to clean up your diet a little bit, I would say include more fruits and vegetables. I would say make sure you have a serve of protein at every meal. And I would say choose the healthier fats from plants and decrease the fried foods in order to increase your satisfaction with your meals. No New Year's bakery. Look, if it's on the way back from the family trip and you rolling through Victoria, they've got some really sweet bakeries. What if I got like a shepherd's pie? Potato, protein, a country one too. One's got meat in it. Oh, they they are good. I think that has a high like life satisfaction value. Yeah. Gonna be looking for something after it though, aren't I? You're gonna be looking for something afterward, which is fine. It's okay if you're in a car for five hours, but it's not if you're not. But if you're doing it every day, we could probably be doing a bit better. Yeah. But anyway, I think that that kind of sums it up. So basically eat more vegetables. It's always the the uh takeaway from me. Wow. Where do you get a dietitian in to hear that? I really appreciate you coming in again. Like, thanks for that. That was really good. It is a big topic on uh, Instagram these days, influencers versus science. And it looks like everybody's on the right track as long as we're telling a good story. Yeah. A bit of context, bit of science. Never hurt anyone. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Greg. No worries. See ya. Today's podcast was brought to you by our partners in Fit, Happy and Healthy, ASN, Nutrition Warehouse, DY Discount Vitamins, Fat Burners Only, Evelyn Fay, Mr. Supplement, or find a retailer online at bodyscience.com.au forward slash retailers.